As I stand here before you, I can honestly say that I'm in a very happy place. I have a wonderful network of friends and I have a fantastic wife with five small kids and I have twins of seven months of age so I was getting some great advice there from the two lads a while ago. I have two companies that I am hugely passionate about and I can very much relate to what the earlier speakers were saying about finding a job you like, like and never working a day in your life. I have Front Row Speakers which is a, a speakers agency that sources speakers for motivational training, leadership, hospitality. Uh, we have uh, the Pendulum Summit which is an event we've had twice already. It's becoming an annual event. We had uh, nearly 2,000 people at the convention centre last January. Uh, Deepak Chopra was our keynote. We had Willie Walsh, we had Keith Ferrazzi, Orla Carmody here spoke for us as well. And this event actually genuinely made a difference to people's lives. And it's a great feeling to be in uh, a position to be able to do something you love and actually help people as well along the way. Uh, I get to spend uh, plenty of time doing charity work as well in my free time and I, I spread myself a lot there. I coach the under nines uh, rugby team in Cork Constitution where my son plays Frankie Oak and it's a, a great place to be. Um, and I'm a rugby pundit with RTE and Sky Sports and yes I get a few bob to go around to uh, watch matches and, and talk about the game I absolutely adore so it's great. And I'm also as previously mentioned on the board of Fall to Ireland. And it's a huge privilege for me to be on that board, especially in a time of such exciting time in tourism in this country. However, it wasn't always like this for me. And yes, I was a professional rugby player between 1996 and 2009, and spent 14 years uh, competing at the top level. But among that time, and if I'm very honest with you, there were some huge, huge disappointments and some horrific lows in that period of time. I was, when I first set out, I had a neck, I ended up having a neck injury uh, at one point that kept me, uh, the doctor, the neurosurgeon said that I was never play rugby again and somehow I managed to come back uh, after 12 months. But the timing of a lot of this adversity that I had was horrific in that all the goals that I wanted to achieve in my rugby career, a lot of them I didn't achieve and it was hugely disappointed. I had seven operations, uh, I had one heart ablation to correct atrial fibrillation, a five hour procedure and I went back and I played a year of rugby after that. I had a pec uh, injury that actually finished my career in 2009. I think. The lowest point had to be in Australia in 2001 uh, when uh, after arriving in Australia for an Irish tour I was asked to uh, immediately return home to answer uh, an offence that I had taken my Benton and Hader um, in a previous semi-final of a Heineken Cup match. I went back um, and I had taken a, a, my inhaler for my exercise all through my rugby career and uh, as early as nine months of age and uh, apparently the form, uh, the exemption form for this particular tournament had not been ticked, even though it had been ticked on every other time. And I had tested positive for uh, my Ventolin inhaler in my system. Uh, I went back and uh, we went to answer these, uh, this tribunal and uh, we thought it was just a routine thing. I went in and I was given two years of suspension. This was a, a, an absolutely uh, horrific time for me. For somebody whose values were honesty and integrity, um, and who would have gone as far to say as if you had known somebody who cheated and swore that they shouldn't be banned for a day or a week or a month or a year, but they should be banned for life. All of a sudden, I found myself uh, being uh, the subject of somebody who had potentially cheated in, in their sport, and of course, some uh, vicious media articles circulated subsequently, and it was a uh, it was a rotten, rotten time for me. We appealed, and we did everything we could in, in, in the meantime, and thanks to the God, we got a fair hearing, and within uh, I was back playing within three months. But again, it felt like there was a curse on me. Every time I felt like I was making a breakthrough, something like this would happen, 
and I, I would go on to have to fight it and, and, and challenge that adversity. Uh, in 2009 I retired and um, being a short career I had invested my money in, in property and uh, shortly after retiring, uh, as Robert Frost so eloquently put it, the bank had given me an umbrella uh, in the fine weather and they had now decided to ask for it back when the rain started. And as we all know, the rain, it wasn't just rain, it was hailstone, it was storms. And I found myself not just in a position that I was trying to protect my pension, but I was trying to protect the family home that sheltered my children. Why am I telling you all this? I'm supposed to be standing up here motivating you this morning, not depressing you. But as Deepak Chopra once said, in every failure lies the seeds of success. And I look back and all that adversity that I had, and even the monks, uh, the Buddhist monks would actually pray for adversity. And when I look back on that adversity, it has shaped me into the person I am today. And it has given me and helped me find my calling. So this might baffle a lot of you sitting down there looking up at me this morning, but I'm actually grateful for the adversity I've had in my life. And in doing so, I want to share with you four areas that I feel have helped me in this journey uh, through thick and thin over the years. And these areas are positive mental attitude, avoiding excuse-itis, authentic leadership, and getting the process right. You can smile now again, the sad bit is over, okay? Positive mental attitude gets thrown around an awful lot and I'm lucky I came from a place of being in professional sport and seeing the motivation on the side of that. Working with some great leaders and the likes of Paul O'Connell and Mick Galway and Brian O'Driscoll and so forth. But as Zig Ziglar says, motivation is like washing. That's why we recommend it daily. So how often are we here? Do we, uh, we're out of shape so we decide to uh, draw up a fitness program and go to the gym and we work to lose that weight and get that weight off us. But we don't do that enough when it comes to our mental fitness. We totally forget about it, we get busy, we get caught up with the mundane things and we totally forget about it. And guess what happens, those big monsters, that they come into our head. We all know those monsters, everybody has them and they start telling you how bad you are and, and uh, you can't do this Frankie or you can't do that Orla, you can't do these things, right? So. These monsters, I don't care who you are, they come into your head and you've got to deal with them head on. And the more energy you give these monsters, the more they'll, they'll, they'll feed, right? So it's like, for example, they'll tell you uh, starting a race, somebody starting a race and the butterflies start and of course the monster will come into your head and say, ah, oh, that's it, look, the butterflies are here, you're nervous, you're sweaty palms, you don't have saliva in your mouth you're going to lose, you're feeling, you're weak, you're feeling terrible. So how do you deal with that monster for an example? You turn around to that monster and you say to them, you know what, this is great. This is my body preparing myself for this event. Yes, I have butterflies, but I'm going to make these butterflies fly in formation. And that is the type of dialogue that we all need to be having in our head. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb after 10,000 attempts. And he was asked by a media person uh, afterwards, he said, um, Thomas, how did you keep going after failing 9,999 times? And Thomas Edison looked uh, quite uh, puzzled as he answered the question. He said, what do you mean fail? He said, inventing the light bulb was a 10,000 step process. So we, we got to control the language. We got to control the talk of failure. Uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2002, when I played uh, with Munster, uh, we lost uh, a third final, we lost, we'd lost two Heineken Cups and we'd lost the Celtic League final and we lost against Leicester 15-9 uh, at the Millennium Stadium and it was a, a really, really disappointing time. And I remember Declan Kidney, who was our coach at the time, spotted this in me and had a quick conversation but felt that it was beyond his, his remit and suggested I go to the sports psychologist, which I did. Uh, Declan Ahern, based up in UL, a really good guy. And I explained to Declan how how my motivation was at an all-time low and how I felt I couldn't keep going and keep myself motivated to build myself up for the following year. And he said, Frankie, it's fine. It's fine to be disappointed. That's a good thing, actually. 
He said, well, can I suggest something? I said, of course, Declan, you can. Why don't you use the 10-yard rule? I said, Declan, what's the 10-yard rule? He said, well, when Tiger Woods hits a bad shot, contrary to belief that he moves on immediately and starts thinking about the next shot, he doesn't. He allows himself the time to uh, put his club into his bag and walk and before he walks that 10 yards he gives out he moans he bitches he does whatever he needs to do to get it out of his system right but after that 10 yards he moves on and he starts looking forward again and you know something it was probably one of the best pieces of advice i've ever got and this can be used in all aspects of life i've used this for uh, people for bereavements for uh, not hitting targets in in, in work and I don't care who you are guys, everybody in your day-to-day -day running, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're whatever you're doing, there will be targets you won't hit, there will be doors closed to your face. And it's okay to be disappointed, but one of the suggestions I would have is to try and use uh, this 10-yard rule. And just have faith that, that, as Steve Jobs said, it's hard to connect the dots looking forward. Uh, and if you haven't seen that YouTube clip, you should watch it, it's a fantastic clip. But just have faith. That, when, when, that they will connect when you read to look backwards, right? So, um, so if I could just suggest something on the positive mental attitude, get yourself right. I mean, if it means you uh, do your meditation twice a day for 15 minutes, do that. If it means you go to mass once a week to get your time, if it means listening to music, going down to the market uh, on, a, on a Saturday morning, do what it takes for you. For me, I try and spend five minutes every other day uh, spending time just showing a bit of gratitude to myself and focusing on my goals so get yourself right fight those monsters the second area is avoid excuseitis i see some puzzled faces looking up for me now uh, david j schwartz in the magic of thinking big spoke about this excuses are the currency of failure did you know 85 percent of americans now apparently come from a dysfunctional family all right so there's an excuse, everybody has an excuse, everybody has a crutch. And how many people do we know and how many times have we found ourselves saying, oh, well, I can't do that because I'm too old or I'm too young or I don't have time, right? Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, became the US president just short of his 70th birthday. The two, uh, don't have enough time is a very popular one, actually. Uh, but did you know that everyone in this carriage here, myself and we all have the exact same amount of time as Dennis O'Brien, as J.P. McManus, as John Magner, as Warren Buffett. We all have the exact same amount of time. It's how you use it. And that's the important thing. Excusitis. Um, there's loads of examples. Health is another thing. I can't do that because I have a bad back. Or, you know, Franklin D. Roosevelt spent most of his life inside in a wheelchair. So. Going back to my rugby career with the excuse excuseitis, we didn't use excuses when we were at the height of it with Munster. We had every reason not to succeed. We certainly didn't have anywhere near the resources, the facilities, the budgets, uh, even the coaching staff to compete with the best teams. We didn't focus on that. Focus on what you can do. Don't focus on the excuses. And it's not, it's not uh, don't feel it's a weakness if you have a limiting belief. But what I would be suggesting to you this morning is, do something about it. Go see a hypnotherapist, go see a, a counsellor, a psychologist. There's all sorts of methods to get these things out of your system. Authentic leadership. As I said, I've been very lucky to work under some great leaders. There's over 100,000 books on Amazon on leadership. I was lucky enough to do a diploma, a higher diploma in the uh, Irish Management Institute recently on leadership. So I'm gonna summarize everything. Uh, all those 100,000 books in the next uh, three minutes. <laughs> we mentioned about excuses, and one of the great leaders that we all know, most of us should know in this country, is Joe Schmidt, who is the uh, coach of the Irish team. Joe doesn't use excuses. In fact, Joe recently, when Ireland about a year and a half ago, lost that famous game to New Zealand, the head of the referees uh, told him actually that it was a mistake, that the penalty that led up to the try that they ended up losing that game was a mistake. And nearly every other coach I know would have jumped on that. But you know what Joe said? He said, you know what, whatever about that, what really annoyed me was the seven system errors that we had after that. That is the difference between potentially turning the ball over and not. And that, I mean, that is real leadership material. I mean, someone like 
one of the real gurus in leadership is a guy called Daniel Goleman. And he talks about the different styles of leadership. And there are six different styles, and from being a democratic to being a coercive to being an authoritative, etc. right? There are six different styles. And what he's saying actually is there's a place for every one of them depending on the context that you find themself, yourself in. And he compares it to being on a golf course. And very often if you're, you're hitting, a, a, you hit your drive, you know what your driver use. If you're on the green, you use your putter. But occasionally you need to take a bit more time to decide on what club you're going to use for that particular shot. Joe Schmidt, when he comes out to the media, after a match he's like a lamb he's like oh you're right yeah i think we should have done better and we were going to work on that but i can tell you when he goes back into that dressing room he is reading the riot act to them it depends on the context of the situation how you do it other areas of leadership which is very which are very important is finding your blind spots and we all there's there's a common um, thought process out there that i'm going to find what i'm weak at and i'm going to improve and work on that and that's fine but it's firstly finding out what your blind spots are. And there's all sorts of techniques you can use to do that. And there's, there's the 360 analysis. You get your peers and different people to, to tell you uh, about yourself as well, not just give you uh, your own opinion, right? And when you do find these blind spots, yes, you can go work on them. But it's okay, actually, to just say, you know what? You get to a stage where I'm just not good at that area anymore. I'm sure the lads would realize that in the, in the restaurant business, if one of them didn't have a good personality, well, maybe they're not best to be front of house. But once they know that, there's nothing worse than being out there not knowing that. But they just get somebody else to cover their tracks there. Finding out what your value system are is. Some great leaders I know are able to, within 30 seconds, they can write out their values here in front of them. And what a good value system does for you, right? While we get pulled and dragged, it's, it's like an anchor in the seabed. It holds you there and we get pulled and dragged left and right. But when you make decisions and when you go to answer uh, big calls, having that value system, that anchor there is hugely beneficial and great leaders have that. Emotional intelligence is another area that gets thrown around quite a, quite a bit. But communication is so important. Communicating your story and listening skills, and I, I think a very good one at the Pendulum Summit that Keith Ferrazzi, a New York Times bestseller, spoke about. He said, you don't have to be interesting, you don't have to be interesting, just be interested. And I think that's a very useful tip for a lot of people here. So, the long and short of it, with regard to leadership and what I would be um, throwing out to you guys here this morning is, don't try and mimic anybody else but just try and be yourself with more skill. The final point here I have is getting the process right. Uh, what does that mean? I mean? We had a coach, Alan Gaffney, spoke all the time about getting the process right. Don't worry about the outcome. If you get the five minutes, the 10 minutes, the, every line out, every pass, every kick, if you get all those small things right, the outcome will look after itself. It took me a long time to actually properly understand that and sometimes people uh, visualize too much about the end outcome. I think it's important to have the end outcome in mind, but you've got to focus on the day-to-day -day running. You've got to focus on that conversation that you're having with the person across from you, that sales pitch you're having, that telephone call, that email. You have to focus on the here and now. Um, there's a book called The Science of Getting Rich by uh, Wallace Wattles. And I mean, he compares it to doing things in a particular way. And he said, it's like the law of gravity. If you jump off a building, you'll hit the ground. If you do things, every single task that you do, every meeting, every email you send, every person you meet, if you do that interaction to the best of your ability every time, it's like a law of gravity. You can't but be successful, both monetary and in other aspects of your life as well. Um, if you haven't seen, and I most of you I'm sure have, the uh, Any Given Sunday and the Al Pacino clip when he talks about the inches. And normally in a presentation like this, I would be able to show it here behind us, but that's what makes this uh, uh, more unique. And in that presentation, I would suggest, look at it if you haven't seen it on YouTube. But Al Pacino talks about inches, and he talks about the winning of the match being in winning of all the individual inches. And if you think about that, it's so important and it's so true that the difference between winning and losing is at the end of the match when you add up all of those inches 
That is the difference between winning and losing. And I know that from, from my sporting days, that you can never put your finger on one thing, but it was every scrum, it was the accuracy at every line out, it was that extra tackle, it was getting off up off the ground quick, and it was all those small inches, and that is the difference, right? And I look at my own business, the Pendulum Summit, and, and people say, you know, Frankie, you nearly 2,000 people last January, what was it down to? Was it down to your keynote speaker, Deepak Shogun? Was it down to Willie Walsh? Was it down, who was it? And the answer is, it's down to all those small inches. It's down to trying and using every one of your bits of resources and just finding a way or make a way. Right? That's a quote from Tony Robbins. Uh, find a way or make a way. Because it can happen for you. So, they are the four areas I've picked this morning. Um, I hope they've been somewhat beneficial to you. I'm trying to have a look there again. but positive mental attitude, avoiding excuse-itis, authentic leadership, and getting the process right. Before I finish, I'd just like to give enormous credit to Irish Rail for this fantastic facility that we're on at the moment. I spend about maybe two or three days a week traveling up and down this, and to be able now to commute to Dublin um, within, within two hours is, you know, just over two hours is a fantastic facility. I mean, to be able to come on, you can charge your, your iPad, you can uh, have your food, you can have a snooze, you can watch Netflix, you can mingle, you can do whatever you need to do. And it's a great facility. And as a, as a you know, from my fall to Ireland hat on for a second, it's great for tourism, but also business tourism as well. Um, but one of the things I'd like to say is a real proud Cork man, and we've always had a, a great uh, rivalry with Dublin. But I think it's now time to, for Cork people to turn around and say, celebrate the fantastic city we have just up the road from us in Dublin. Dublin is a fantastic city, it's a vibrant city and it is flying at the moment and it's services like this commuting between the two with just over two hours we should celebrate that because the better Dublin does the better Cork will do as well. So guys look I hope I, I didn't uh, bring you down too much in the earlier part of my presentation and um, I hope maybe there's something I said that maybe you already knew but it might have reinforced something. Uh, I'm certainly uh, enjoying this train journey but I'm enjoying the journey of life even more. Thank you very much. Yeah.